Hi, welcome to another day with Bridge. Uh, Calvary Chapel as we're doing our daily Bible study together. We call it the Bridge Connection and that's simply because we want to be connected during this time of pand pandemic. We started it then and we're just, uh, we did a lot of topical studies for the first several weeks and uh, we decided that we wanted to kind of just go through the Word. So we're going to, we've been doing Mark verse by verse and we're going to be in the middle of Mark 4 today. So if you haven't been with us before this, just jump in, uh, join us. You can go back and uh, check what we've already done if you want to. You don't have to, but if you want to, it's on both our Facebook and uh, YouTube. So we've already done. I hope that those of you that are watching are enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying doing it. It's just um, really been a lot of fun for me, and I hope it's uh, been fun for you. I'm learning so much. Uh, I don't know how many times I've I've taught this book, and I'm I'm learning so much right now that I, I I've known, I guess, but um, it's just making a difference to me, and I'm learning it again, or even learning new stuff. There's there's nothing wrong with uh, learning new things. Uh, God can take the same verses we read a hundred times and uh, has a new meaning to us every time we read it. So let's start with Mark chapter four. We're picking up verse twenty-one. Okay, Mark chapter four, verse twenty-one. Also, he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, you know, uh, share and share the truth. Don't, don't be stingy. Don't, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Share the truth. What he's saying is that when you have light, um, you're to set it in the most conspicuous place. Where it can be best seen, you take the candles and, and you set it in the most conspicuous place where it can give the most light and, and, and help brighten up your room or wherever you are. And Jesus shared a very simple fact. He said a candle is to be placed on a candlestick. The candle or lamp is a, a symbol, a type of truth. It, it stands for the light of the truth. Light and truth are, are to be the, the character. Oh, even beyond that, it, it's, it's light and truth are to be our very our nature. Light and truth are to be our behavior. We are to set the candle, the truth, in the most conspicuous place in our lives. Light and truth are also to be our, be our witness, be our witness to the truth. We are to share the candle and its light with others. We are to place the truth in the most conspicuous place possible, right in the middle of our lives. A candle is not to be placed under a, a bushel basket. The basket would extinguish its light and it would no longer be able to, to fulfill its purpose. It could not give off its light. Its flame and light would, would no longer exist. However, notice something. The candle would still be a candle but it would be a candle with, with no purpose, um, hidden, as it were, under a bushel basket. It goes on to say that a candle is not to be put under a bed. It would carelessly set the bed on fire and destroy it. The candle would be serving the wrong purpose. It would tragically be being used, well, it would be using its flame and, and light for the wrong, use, for the wrong reason. It, it would still be a candle, yeah, absolutely. But it would be a candle using its flame and light in the wrong way. You know, God gives the light of the truth. He gives it to us for a specific purpose, that that light and truth would be shared. God wants others to see and know the light, the truth and purpose of life. We must make sure that we do not hide or misuse the light of the truth. And the Father wants that out there so much because he wants the world to know what his son did to give them hope. It says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is not set on the hill cannot be hid. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. That's Ephesians 5, 8. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine <laughs> as lights in the world. Jesus warned, he says, now, now listen, everything is, all things are going to be revealed. Absolutely nothing is going to be hid, except temporarily, everything that isn't revealed exactly on the moment that, that it happened. Even if we hide the candle and we, we keep it secret, the day is coming when it'll be, it'll, it'll be revealed anyway. The Greek says, there is nothing hid unless except it should be made manifest. Nor has a secret thing taken place, but that it should come to light. This can mean a couple of things, I think. Um, light and truth cannot be hid or extinguished or used for the wrong purpose forever. Maybe for a period of time, but both light and truth will break forth someday because it is truth and it is light. The bushel will be lifted. Uh, the bed may be consumed and the light and truth will be seen and will fulfill their original purpose, whether we allow that or not in our lives. If we hide or misuse the light and, and the truth that God has given us, then what we have done will be revealed someday and what he's done will be revealed someday. We, we cannot hide and misuse the light and truth forever. His light, his truth will be revealed. He's God and he wants to use us to reveal that light, but he doesn't have to because he's gonna reveal it. Verse 24 and 25 of Mark 4. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So Jesus says, take heed. Make absolutely certain that, that, that you hear the truth. And, and what Jesus is, is still talking about here, he's talking about our responsibility as the hearer. We are responsible for hearing the truth. We are very responsible for, for what we hear and how we interpret what is being said. We are responsible for making sure that we have the truth, that we possess and know the truth. We're responsible for what we hear, possess, and know. If people don't tell us about Jesus, God will, God will make it known anyway. He will tell us about Jesus somehow. Jesus states that we must take heed and make absolutely certain we hear the truth. There, there's a principle of truth that, that takes effect in every person's life. And it's pointedly clear. The measure to which we give ourselves to know the truth determines our reward. The energy, the effort, the degree of commitment, the time and, and depth of thought, all that we give to know the truth determines our reward. If we just, you know, just skim over it, if it, it does not become part of our lives. If we give ourselves to know the truth, we'll be given more truth, says in Mark 24. We shall have the truth and we shall be given more truth, it says in Mark 4, 25. And it says in Mark 4, 25, if we do not give ourselves into the truth, we're gonna lose it. Everything will be taken away from us and we've gotta grab that, whether we, you know, it doesn't say exactly that way, but that's, that's what it's saying, we need to understand that. The commitment, the energy, the effort, the work, the knowledge, the degree to which we give ourselves to the truth of God, that determines how much God is able to entrust and give to us. Common sense tells us this, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. And everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be open. If we're not doing that, it's not going to be open. We have to seek and knock and ask. Also says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to be studying and, and having the things to say to people when they ask the questions. And 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, 
as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. We are to be judged for what we have heard. We are to take heed. We are to uh, govern what we hear. We are to give ourselves to, to hear the truth. And it says this, you all know this verse, but let me just quote it for you. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. We're going to pick it up at uh, verse 26 of chapter 4. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Jesus is describing one aspect of, of the kingdom of God in this parable. The kingdom, you can call it the church for now if you want to, but it's where Jesus is. And its, its citizens will and do grow. The kingdom is, is looked at in its present state here on earth. And the kingdom of God is growing more and more people are being reached for God. You don't hear a lot about it, but it's happening all over the world. We do hear a lot about some of it. And as they are reached, they are growing just as God wills them to grow. Verse 26 again says, And he said, The kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground. It's a man who sows the seed. The seed has to be sown by somebody. There simply is no other way for the seed to get out there. That's us, guys. We are the people, the beings, the means, the instruments God has chosen to share the gospel with the world. It's the ground, the earth, where the seed is sown. It's the earth that God wants, wants to reach. It's the earth. It's, it's the people here on this earth that God wants to reach. God wants the earth to hear the good news. God has sent his followers, you and me, out into this earth to cast forth, forth the, the, the seed of the, of the gospel. So important we understand that. Go into all the world all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 4, 27 says, And should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and himself does not know, Connect that with verse 26. He's talking about he sows the seed and then he, he doesn't, the, the farmer plants his seed, then he goes about his regular affairs. He sleeps and rises day by day. And while he carries on the, the routine of his life, the seed germinates, springs up, grows. The point is this the seed grows by its own virtue. The seed uses the sun, water, air, and earth to grow. But the power to germinate, the, to, to break forth and grow is of the seed itself by its own virtue. It's not man who makes the seed grow. We don't do that. We, we don't even know how the mysterious growth takes place. The secret of life and growth is beyond us. We don't understand that. We, we discover things. We arrange things. We develop things, but we do not create, not in the true sense of creation. And it's the same with the kingdom of God, with the growth of, of believers, both individually and, and collectively. Growth is not of man. Growth is of God. It's the spirit of God that takes the gospel and changes our heart and 
causes it to grow. It's the Spirit of God that recreates us spiritually, that causes a man to be born again and, and, and grow in grace. You know, one of the things I've, I've been doing this pastoring for um, 48 years, I believe it is, and um, I have heard so many times, so I've been in so many churches, I've been, with, been involved with so many pastor groups, and different denominations and non-denominations, and been involved in teaching Bible colleges and just so many things. That, and, and you know, what I've heard so many times is, I think I gotta find a new church because I'm just not getting fed. And you know what I say? I say, if you shut up long enough and listen, you're gonna get fed. Because, because I believe that every pastor out there is, is if, if God has you in that flock, he has something for you to learn there. Maybe he'll move you at some time, absolutely. But stay there, be supportive, open your ears, shut your mouth, and listen to what the pastor that God has given you has to say. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them, gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I love that, it's God's will. Growth comes because it's God. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. All right, verse 28, Mark chapter four. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. Growth is sure. Growth is absolutely inevitable. It is going to happen. But two conditions are absolutely essential. Um, uh, the ground must be good ground. Mark 4.20. And the seed must be sown in the ground. If these two conditions exist, then growth is both inevitable and unstoppable. Even a small blade of grass will find a crack in the pavement. You've seen that. Nothing can stop, stop the seed from growing. And we can rest assured, be sure of this. We are truly God's child. And God will complete the work of grace in our life. The grace of God planted in our heart is absolutely unstoppable. Our confidence, hear me, our confidence is in God, not in our own flesh, not in our weak errors. Therefore, there's no reason for being down or discouraged, withdrawn or depressed. There, there's, there's no reason for that because God began it. God will complete it. Philippians 1, 6, you know this verse, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 13, I love this one too. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Growth is constant, but it's gradual, ever so gradual. Uh, it's our, our growth is gradual. We, we want to we want to grow go from this to this, you know, so quickly, but it doesn't happen. It's gradual. The, the seed is sown, and then day after day and night after night passes before the blade ever springs up. Then many more days and, and nights pass before the the ear begins to form. It takes weeks before the full ear of corn appears. Growth does take place. It is constant. It takes time, it doesn't happen overnight. Why? Because growth is of God and we are to trust him and, and to wait upon him for growth. But the trust and waiting are to be active, a working trust and waiting. There is no such thing as inactive faith and waiting, not to God. Faith and waiting upon God are active. They both serve and work, do everything God's calling them to do, whether it's reading, studying, talking, praying. There is great abuse of this glorious truth, the truth of sheer growth, of being secure in God's promises. Man has used it for the fact 
I say I'm secure no matter what I do so I can go ahead and live as I wish. To say that God assures his kingdom and its growth so there is no need for me to sacrifice to meet the needs of the world. Sure of error. And to say that believers in church will grow without me, therefore I don't have to go and serve, not personally, they don't need me. Growth requires much patience and a whole lot of trust. See, we want instant everything. There's not instant growth in Christ, it takes time. Mark 4, 29. But when the green ripens, immediately he puts it in the sickle because the harvest has come. The fruit does ripen. The day, <coughs> excuse me, does come when the corn is, is fully grown, it's ready to be harvested. This can mean a couple of things. Um, our sowing does bear fruit. Jesus honors his word. Please understand that. His word never returns void. We can rest assured of reaping some harvest, maybe not the one we expected, maybe not as much as we expected, maybe more, but just trust. What an encouragement to us as believers. How we should be challenged to work and work and work for our Lord. Why? Because we're absolutely assured he has given us his word of results. Before we ever stop laboring, he's already told us we're going to have results. God assures that fruit will be born. So you don't get offers like that from anybody but God. <laughs> I love that. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things where I send it. Where I sent it. You want to memorize that one. It's Isaiah 55, 11. You quote it all the time. I know you do, but you need to know where it is and really get it memorized. We as believers are harvested, taken on to heaven when our growth is completed. When we have done all that God wills for us and all that we are going to do, God then escorts us home forever. The Rocky Mountains in Colorado are beautiful, but they can sometimes be deadly. People will sometimes wander off from their party thinking they know where they are going and then they can't find their way back. Mountains and valleys look remarkably similar to other mountains and valleys. When someone gets lost in these mountains, search and rescue teams are pulled together to cover that area. It's particularly harrowing when the missing person is a child. There's a story about a woman who was frantic when she discovered her daughter was missing in the Rocky Mountains. She thrashed through the woods, screaming her daughter's name. She went back to the campsite and called for help. Within half an hour, a search team had been organized. It began sweeping the area, calling out at regular intervals for the little, little lost girl. The woman sat down on a rock for a moment to rest. How would she ever find her little girl? The beauty of the mountains surrounded her and yet she was blind to all of that. Birds sang, but all she could hear was the volunteer search team pounding through the woods, calling to her daughter and to one another. Suddenly she, de she decided that she and the other searchers were making so much noise that they could not hear the girl if she was yelling for help or crying. So she made a decision. She relayed that information to the others and in moments, everyone was silent, just standing quietly. And the mother began to listen, nothing. She listened harder every pore in her body, every fiber, every muscle strained to hear the one voice she would recognize above all others. And she, <laughs> and she heard a little girl calling to her. By carefully listening and following the sound of her voice, the woman was reunited with her daughter. Hear me, God is speaking to us. 
trying to get our attention, trying to tell us of his love. Most of the time, I think that we're all, including myself, making too much noise to hear him. We fill our lives with physical noise and television and, and movies and CD radios and Or we'll fill them with psychic noise like work. And we have too many leisure activities, too much busyness. We thrash through the woods of our lives encompassed in darkness and despair. And yet God calls us to listen. When we come to a quiet place, Mark 6.31, we'll talk about the death when we get there, but you can read it later, Mark 6.31. What happens? We prepare ourselves to hear. When we rest from the, the busyness and turn off the noise, we enter into a holy place. Be like the mother whose daughter was lost and yearned to hear God's voice. Delight in his voice. When you hear his voice, act on what he tells you. It may not be a command like, leave everything and go to a country that I will show you. It may not be. Give away everything to the poor. Perhaps God just wants to tell you that he loves you. While we cannot be sure of everything in our quiet times is from God, we can be assured that God is waiting for us to shut off our noise long enough to enjoy him. And we, especially in our culture, we are so addicted to our noise. As soon as we walk in, we have to turn on the television or have our laptops in front of us or our iPhones or smartphones or, or whatever, and we gotta see this or hear this or whatever. And then God's saying, hey, come away with me and to a quiet place. We need to get us some quiet places with God where we can just listen. There are times I uh, maybe not so much this time of year, but when the weather's just a little cooler, I'll drive out in the middle of the desert and just park. And just, God, let us reason together. Sometimes I just, I, I, I just am quiet. Sometimes I hear him say something, sometimes I don't. I don't hear an audible voice, but he speaks to the heart. Show us verses in the, in the word. But he wants to lead us and guide us. But sometimes we're so busy and so noisy that he can't get our attention. So I would suggest that we, we all do that, especially now during this time that we're back in our homes. Well, a lot of us, we want to be there. And I, I know for some of you that your kids are always there, uh, but maybe when they go to bed or maybe when they're, they're playing or, or those of you that don't have children or whatever, just seize these quiet moments that you find throughout the day and spend them with, with God, would you? Hey, thanks a lot for joining me today. I'm gonna to close. I'm not even gonna pray with you and pray for you. I'm gonna ask that as I just, just close out of here that you would spend some time in quiet prayer before God, even now, and ask him to speak to your heart and tell you what he has for it. What, what he wants you to do. Maybe it's just to hear him say, I love you. He wants us to be able to hear his voice. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.